Hello everyone, good evening, welcome to another live read where we'll be drawing again from the great British short stories and today we'll be reading James Joyce's The Boarding House and I'll get to that shortly but just before we begin I just want to remind you that coming up for Halloween this month in October, this Sunday we have the Halloween, some information about Halloween, the origin, meaning and tradition. Next Sunday the 23rd I'll be reading the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and for Halloween proper we will have Dracula which I'm looking forward to and just a reminder once we hit the 5,000 subscriber mark which we're fast approaching I'm happy to tell you guys I will be reading Boy here at the channel so yeah if you know anyone that's interested in live reads and bookish content please uh, yeah, send them our way so they can subscribe and we'll get to boy much quicker. And before I get into what um, the boarding house is about, I just think it's only right that I read a bit of information about James Augustine Aloysius Joyce, born February 1882 and died January 1941. He was an Irish novelist, poet and literary critic. He contributed to the modernist avant-garde movement and is regarded as one of the most influential and important writers of the 20th century. Joyce's novel Ulysses is a landmark in which the episodes of Homer's Odyssey are paralleled in a variety of literary styles, particularly stream of consciousness. Other well-known works are the short story collection Dubliners, from which the boarding house is taken from, and the novels A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and Finnegan's Wake. And The Boarding House is a short story by James Joyce, published in his 1914 collection, Dubliners, which I've just said. And it says here that we have um, Mrs. Mooney looks forward to her confrontation, which she intends to win by defending her daughter's honour and convincing Mr. Doran to offer his hand in marriage. Waiting for the time to pass, Mrs. Mooney figures the odds are in her favour, considering that Mr. Doran, who has worked for a wine merchant for 13 years and garnered much respect, will choose the option that least harms his career. Then we go on. I'm not going to read this second paragraph from Wikipedia because it will spoil the story. And for those of you who are here already, um, we don't want any spoiler alerts. But ultimately, it's about this conversation between Mrs. Mooney and Mr. Doran about the relationship and potential marriage of the daughter. Um, that's how I read into it. And as always, guys, if you love in book club, please be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to help us out, share the show with your social media friends and followers. If you have a, a giant million following, that would be very helpful if you could get that out to them. Or if just not with your friends and family, if they like stories. <clears throat> But that's enough of all that, all those introductions. Sometimes I feel I should just come on and just begin reading. Let me know what you think. Should I just uh, cut out all that nonsense and just read? Because that's what I'm here to do, really. But it's the game, innit? It's the YouTube game we got to play. <clears throat> James Joyce. Here's a bit of information about him first. He was one of a large family described by his father as 16 or 17 children the dad didn't know. Imitate intimations of the startling original talent that was to produce Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake were first discernible in his short stories in which he portrayed the people of his hometown with wit, sympathy and powerful realism. Yeah, I think Finnegan's Wake is another popular story by him. But anyway, The Boarding House by James Joyce. Mrs. Mooney was a butcher's daughter. She was a woman who was quite able to keep who was quite able to keep things to herself, a determined woman. She had married her father's foreman and opened a butcher's shop near Spring Gardens. But as soon as his father in law was dead, Mr. Mooney began to go to the devil. He drank, plundered the till, ran headlong into debt. It was no use making him take the pledge. He was sure to break out again in a few days after. By fighting his wife in the presence of customers and by buying bad meat, he ruined his business. 
One night he went for his wife with a cleaver, and she had to sleep in a neighbor's house. After that they lived apart. She went to the priest and got a separation from him with care of the children. She would give him neither money nor food nor house room, and so he was obliged to enlist himself as a sheriff's man. He was a shabby, stooped little drunkard with a white face and a white moustache and white eyebrows, penciled above his little eyes, which were pink-veined and raw. And all day long he sat in the bailiff's room, waiting to be put on a job. Mrs. Mooney, who had taken what remained of her money out of the butcher business and set up a boarding house in Hardwick Street, was a big, imposing woman. Her house had a floating population made up of tourists from Liverpool and the Isle of Man and occasionally artistes from the music halls. Its resident population was made up of clerks from the city. She governed the house cunningly and firmly knew when to give credit, when to be stern, and when to let things pass. All the resident young men spoke of her as the madam. Hello, Cloudy's Vids. Welcome to the stream. Hi there. Mrs. Mooney's young men paid 15 shillings a week for board and lodgings, beer or stout at dinner excluded. They shared in common tastes and occupations, and for this reason they were very chummy with one another. They discussed with one another the chances of favourites and outsiders. Jack Mooney, the madam's son, who was clerk to a commission agent in Fleet Street, had the reputation of being a hard case. He was fond of using soldiers' obscenities. Usually he came home in the small hours. When he met his friends, he had always a good one to tell them, and he was always sure to be on to a good thing, that is to say, a likely horse or a likely artiste. He was also handy with the mitts and sang comic songs. On Sunday nights there would often be a reunion in Mrs. Mooney's front drawing room. The music hall artistes would oblige and Sheridan played waltzes and polkas and vamped accompaniments. Polly Mooney, the madam's daughter, would also sing. She sang, I'm a naughty girl, you needn't sham, I know I am. Polly was a slim girl of nineteen. She had light, soft hair and a small, full mouth. Her eyes, which were grey with a shade of green through them, had a habit of glancing upwards when she spoke with anyone, which made her look like a little perverse Madonna. <laughs> Mrs. Mooney had first sent her daughter to be a typist in a corn factor's office, but as a disreputable sheriff's man used to come every other day to the office, asking to be allowed to say a word to his daughter, she had taken her daughter home again and set her to do housework. As Polly was very lively, the intention was to give her the run of the young men. Besides, young men like to feel that there is a young woman not very far away. Polly, of course, flirted with the young men, but Mrs. Mooney, who was a shrewd judge, knew that the young men were only passing the time away. None of them meant business. Things went on for so for a long time, and Mrs. Mooney began to think of sending Polly back to typewriting when she noticed that something was going on between Polly and one of the young men. She watched the pair and kept her own counsel. Polly knew she was being watched, but still her mother's persistent silence could not be misunderstood. There had been no open complicity between mother and daughter, no open understanding, but though people in the house began to talk of the affair, still Mrs. Mooney did not intervene. Polly began to grow a little strange in her manner, and the young man was evidently perturbed. At last, when she judged it to be the right moment, Mrs. Mooney intervened. She dealt with moral problems as a cleaver deals with meat, and in this case she had made up her mind. <clears throat> It was a bright Sunday morning of early summer, promising heat but with a fresh breeze blowing. All the windows of the boarding house were open and the lace curtains ballooned gently towards the street beneath the raised sashes. The belfry of George's church sent out constant peals and worshippers, singly or in groups, traversed the little circus before the church, revealing their purpose by their self-contained demeanour no less than by the little volumes in their gloved hands. Breakfast was over in the boarding-house, and the table of the breakfast-room was covered with plates on which lay yellow streaks of eggs with morsels of bacon-fat and bacon-rind. 
Mrs. Mooney sat in the straw armchair and watched the servant Mary remove the breakfast things. She made Mary collect the crusts and pieces of broken bread to help to make Tuesday's bread pudding. When the table was cleared, the broken bread collected, the sugar and butter safe under lock and key, she began to reconstruct the interview which she had had the night before with Polly. Things were as she had suspected. She had been frank in her questions, and Polly had been frank in her answers. Both had been somewhat awkward, of course. She had been made awkward by her not wishing to receive the news in too cavalier a fashion, or to seem to have con connived, and Polly had been made awkward not merely because allusions of that kind always made her awkward, but also because she did not wish to be thought that in her wise innocence she had divined the intention behind her mother's tolerance. Mrs. Mooney glanced in instinctively at the little gilt clock on the mantelpiece as soon as she had become aware, through her reverie, that the bells of St. George's Church had stopped ringing. It was seventeen minutes past eleven. She would have lots of time to have the matter out with Mr. R Mr. Duran, and then catch short twelve at Marlborough Street. She was sure she would win. To begin with, she had all the weight of social opinion on her side. She was an outraged mother. She had allowed him to live beneath her roof, assuming that he was a man of honour, and he had simply abused her hospitality. He was thirty-four or thirty-five years of age, so that youth could not be pleaded as his excuse, nor could ignorance be his excuse, since he was a man who had seen something of the world. He had simply taken advantage of Polly's youth and inexperience. That was evident. The question was, what reparation would he make? There must be reparation made in such a case. It is all very well for the man. He can go his ways as if nothing has happened, having had his moment of pleasure. But the girl has to bear the brunt. Some mothers would be content to patch up such an affair for a sum of money. She had known cases of it, but she would not do so. For her only one reparation could make up for the loss of her daughter's honour, marriage. She counted all her cards again before sending Mary up to Mr. Doran's room to say that she wished to speak with him. She felt sure she would win. He was a serious young man, not rakish or loud voice like the others. If it had been Mr. Sheridan or Mr. Mead or Bantam or Lyons, her task would have been much harder. She did not think he would face publicity. All the lodgers in the house knew something of the affair. Details had been invented by some. Besides, he had been employed for thirteen years in a great Catholic wine merchant's office, and publicity would mean for him, perhaps, the loss of his job, whereas if he agreed, all might be well. She knew he had a good screw for one thing, and she suspected he had a bit of a stuff put by. Nearly the half hour, she stood up and surveyed herself in the, in the pier glass, the decisive expression of her great florid face satisfied her, and she thought of some mothers she knew who could not get their daughters off their hands. Mr. Duran was very anxious indeed this Sunday morning. He had made two attempts to shave, but his hand had been so unsteady that he had been obliged to desist. Three days reddish beard fringed his jaws, and every two or three minutes a mist gathered on the glasses, so that he had to take them off and polish them with his pocket handkerchief. The recollection of his confession of the night before was a cause of acute pain to him. The priest had drawn out every ridiculous detail of the affair, and in the end had so magnified his sin that he was almost thankful at being afforded a loophole of reparation. The harm was done. What could he do now but marry her or run away? He could not brazen it out. The affair would be sure to be talked of, and his employer would be certain to hear of it. Dublin is such a small city. Everyone knows everyone else's business. He felt his heart leap warmly in his throat as he heard in his excited imagination old Mr. Leonard calling out in his rasping voice, Send Mr. Doran here, please. All his young, long years of service gone for nothing, all his industry and diligence thrown away. As a young man he had sown his wild oats, of course, he had boasted of his free thinking and denied the existence of God to his companions in public houses, but that was all past and done with, nearly. 
He still bought a copy of Reynolds' newspaper every week, but he attended to his religious duties, and for nine-tenths of the year lived a regular life. He had money enough to settle down on. It was not that, but the family would look down on her. First of all, there was her disreputable father, and then her mother's boarding-house was beginning to get a certain fame. He had a notion that he was being had. He could imagine his friends talking of the affair and laughing. She was a little vulgar. Sometimes she said, I seen as if, and if I'd have, if, sorry. Sometimes she said, I seen, and if I'd have known. But what would grammar matter if he really loved her? He could not make up his mind whether to like her or despise her for what she had done. Of course he had done it too. His instinct urged him to remain free, not to marry. Once you, once you are married, you are done for, it said. <laughs> Yes, hello Sammy Norton, welcome back. Nice to see a new regular, it's good to have you. I try and do them most nights, just not Friday, Saturday is the only nights I don't normally do them, Sammy, so yeah, keep coming. While he was sitting helplessly on the side of the bed in shirt and trousers, she tapped lightly at his door and entered. She told him all that she had made a clean breast of it to her mother, and that her mother would speak to him that morning. She cried and threw her arms round his neck, saying, Oh, Bob, Bob, what am I to do? What am I to do at all? She would put an end to herself, she said. He comforted her feebly, telling her not to cry, that it would be all right, never fear. He felt against his shirt the agitation of her bosom. It was not altogether his fault that it had happened, he remembered well with the curious, patient memory of the celibate, the first casual caresses of her dress, her breath, her fingers had given him. Then, late one night, as he was undressing for bed, she had tapped at his door, timidly. She wanted to relight her candle at his, for hers had been blown out by a gust. It was her bath night. She wore a loose, open, combing jacket of printed flannel. Her white instep shone in the opening of her furry slippers, and the blood glowed warmly behind her perfumed skin. From her hands and wrists too, as she lit and steadied her candle, a faint perfume arose. On nights when he came in very late, it was she who warmed up his dinner. He scarcely knew what he was eating, feeling her beside him alone at night in the sleeping house, and her thoughtfulness. If the night was any way cold or wet or windy, there was sure to be a little tumbler of punch ready for him. Perhaps they could be happy together. They used to go up. They used to go upstairs together on tiptoe, each with a candle, and on the third landing exchange reluctant good nights. They used to kiss. He remembered well her eyes, the touch of her hand, and his delirium. But delirium passes. He echoed her phrase, applying it to himself. What am I to do? The instinct of the celibate warned him to hold back, but the sin was there. Even his sense of honour told him that reparation must be made for such a sin. While he was sitting with her on the side of the bed, Mary came to the door and said that the missus wanted to see him in the parlour. He stood up to put on his coat and waistcoat, more helpless than ever. When he was dressed, he went over to comfort her. It would be all right, never fear. He left her crying on the bed and moaning, moaning softly. Oh, my God! Going down the stairs, his glasses became so dimmed with moisture that he had to take them off and polish them. He longed to ascend through the roof and fly away to another country where he would never hear again of his trouble, and yet a force pushed him downstairs step by step. The implacable faces of his employer and of the madam stared upon his discomfiture. On the last flight of stairs he passed Jack Mooney, who was coming up from the pantry nursing two bottles of bass. They saluted coldly, and the lover's eyes rested for a second or two on a thick bulldog face and a pair of thick short arms. When he reached the foot of the staircase he glanced up and saw Jack regarding him from the door of the return room. Suddenly he remembered the night when one of the music hall artistes, a little blonde Londoner, had made a rather f free allusion to Polly. The reunion had been almost broken up on account of Jack's violence. Everyone tried to quiet him. The music hall artiste, a little paler than usual, kept smiling and saying that there was no harm meant, 
but Jack kept shouting at him that if any fellow tried that sort of game on his sister, he'd bloody well put his teeth down his throat, so he would. Polly sat for a little time on the side of the bed crying. Then she dried her eyes and went over to the looking-glass. She dipped the end of the towel in the water-jug and refreshed her eyes with the cool water. She looked at herself in profile and readjusted a hairpin above her ear. Then she went back to the bed again and sat at the foot. She regarded the pillows for a long time, and the sight of them awakened in her mind secret, amiable memories. She rested the nape of her neck against the cool iron bed-rail and fell into a reverie. There was no longer any perturbation visible on her face. She waited on patiently, almost cheerfully without alarm, her memories gradually giving place to hopes and visions of the future. Her hopes and visions were so intricate that she no longer saw the white pillows on which her gaze was fixed, or remembered that she was waiting for anything. At last she heard her mother calling. She started to her feet and ran to the banisters. Polly, Polly! Yes, Mamma. Come down, dear. Mr. Doran wants to speak to you. Then she remembered what she had been waiting for. The end. What do you guys think happened? It sounds like, for me anyway, if Mr. Doran was down the downstairs still, then he was going to propose marriage, it seems. Otherwise, he would have run away. Um... But yes, Sammy, I do agree. Uh, I found this, I, I did a video about, um, what was the video called? About uh, the magic bookshelf and a synchronicity. And I found this book. Uh, it's a very thick book. Um, I'm just talking to Sammy here, who's saying these books are amazing. And it's called um, Great British Short Stories. And yeah, it has all of the great British authors from history. And uh, this actually, this book was published in 1974, so quite an old book. And it's got, yeah, loads of, well, all of the brilliant great British authors. And there is a playlist, so you can see the other ones. And it will fill up with, uh, I don't know, there must be 40 little books here. So, I don't know, there seems to be a few of you here. Would, would you like another story, guys? I'll, I'll have to, I'll start another stream. But let me know in the comments quickly if you guys are here for another um, few minutes and we'll, and we'll start another stream. There's six of you here that I can see, so I'll find, uh, if I can find a short one. There's one that's very short. G-E-M skews. Well, I'm... And that one's only a few pages. No pressure. <laughs> I'll tell you what then, because this one's just a short one uh, and Sammy is very keen, uh, as am I, I'm not going to start another stream. This one's only uh, three pages. Okay, guys, so I'm just going to add this to the end of this one as a sort of bonus for anyone that arrives at this point of the stream. We have another story, and this one is by G.E.M. Skews. And it's called Well I'm. So a bit of information about Mr. Skews or Mrs. Skews. Oh no, he, Mr. Skews. He was a family lawyer in London who also applied his acute legal mind to the matter of fishing. Indeed, he invented a new style of fly fishing called nymph fishing. The author of several esoteric books on his favourite hobby, such as Minor Tactics of the Chalk Stream, he could also communicate the sport's amusing side. Well, yeah, let's go. It's called Well I'm. Mr. Theodore Castwell, having devoted a long, strenuous and not unenjoyable life to hunting to their doom innumerable salmon trout and grayling in many quarters of the globe, and having gained much credit among his fellows for his many ingenious improvements in rods, flies and tackle employed for that end, in the fullness of time died, 
and was taken to his own place. St. Peter looked up from a draft balance sheet at the entry of the attendant angel. A gentleman giving the name of Castwell says he is a fisherman, your holiness, and has Fly Fishers Club London on his card. Hmm, says St. Peter. Fetch me the ledger with his account. St. Peter perused it. Hmm, said St. Peter. Show him in. Mr. Castwell entered cheerfully and offered a cordial right hand to St. Peter. As a brother of the angle, he began. Hmm, <laughs> said St. Peter. I'm sure I shall not appeal to you in vain for special consideration in connection with the quarters to be assigned to me here. Hmm, said St. Peter. I have been looking at your account from below. Nothing wrong with it, I hope, said Mr. Castwell. Hmm said St. Peter. I've seen worse. What sort of quarters would you like? Well, said Mr. Castwell, do you think you could manage something in the way of a country cottage of the, of the Test Valley type, with modern conveniences and say three quarters of a mile of one of those pleasant chalk streams, clear as crystal, which proceed from out the throne, attached? Why, yes, said St. Peter. I think we can manage that for you. Then what about your gear? You must have left your fly rods and tackle down below. I see you prefer a light split cane of nine foot or so, with appropriate fittings. I will indent upon the works department for what you require, including a supply of flies. I think you will approve of our dresser's productions. Then you will want a keeper to attend you. Thanks awfully, your holiness, said Mr. Carswell. That will be first rate. To tell the truth from the revelations I read, I was inclined to fear that I might be just a teeny-weeny bit bored in heaven. In? Hmm, said St. Peter, checking himself. <laughs> it was not long before Mr. Carswell found himself alongside an enchantingly beautiful clear chalk stream, some fifteen yards wide, swarming with fine trout, feeding greedily, and presently the attendant angel assigned to him had hand in him the daintiest, most exquisite, light split cane rod conceivable, perfectly balanced with reel and line, with a beautiful damp tapered cast of incredible fineness and strength, and a box of flies of such marvellous tying as to be almost mistakable for the natural insects they were to stimulate. Mr. Carswell scooped up a natural fly from the water, matched it perfectly from the fly box, and knelt down to cast to a riser, putting up just under a tussock ten yards or so above him. The fly lit like a gossamer six inches above the last ring, floated a moment and went under in the next ring, and next moment the rod was making the curve of beauty. Presently, after an exciting battle, the keeper netted out a beauty of about two and a half pounds. Heavens! cried Mr. Castwell. This is something like. I am sure His Holiness will be pleased to hear it, said the keeper. Mr. Carswell prepared to move upstream to the next riser when he became aware that another trout had just taken up the position of that which he had just landed and was rising. Just look at that, he said, dropping instantaneously to his knee and drawing off some line. A moment later an accurate fly fell just above the neb of the fish and instantly Mr. Carswell engaged in battle with another lusty fish. All went well, and presently the landing net received its two and a half pounds. "'A very pretty brace,' said Mr. Carswell, preparing to move on to the next of the string of busy nebs which he had observed putting up round the bend. As he approached the tussock, however, he became aware that the place from which he had just extracted so satisfactory a brace was already occupied by another busy feeder. "'Well, I'm damned!' cried Mr. Carswell. "'Do you see that?' "'Yes, sir,' said the keeper. "'The chance of extracting three successive trout from the same spot "'was too attractive to be foregone, "'and once more Mr. Carswell knelt down "'and delivered a perfect cast to the spot. "'Instantly it was accepted, and battle was joined. "'All held, and presently a third gleaming trout "'joined his brethren in the creel. "'Heavens!' exclaimed Mr. Carswell. Was there ever anything like it? No, sir, said the keeper. Look here, said he to the keeper. I think I really must give this chap a miss and pass on to the next. Sorry, 
It can't be done, sir. His holiness would not like it. Well, if that's really so, said Mr. Carswell, and knelt reluctantly to his task. Several hours later he was still clasping to the same tussock. <laughs> How long is this confounded rise going to last? inquired Mr. Carswell. I suppose it will stop soon. No, sir, said the keeper. What, isn't there a slack hour in the afternoon? No afternoon, sir. What? Then what about the evening rise? No evening, sir, said the keeper. Well, I shall knock off now. I must have had about thirty brace from that corner. Beg pardon, sir, but his holiness would not like that. What? said Mr. Carswell. Mayn't I even stop at night? No night here, sir, said the keeper. Then do you mean that I have to go on catching these damned two and a half pounders at this corner for ever and ever? The keeper nodded. Hell, said Mr. Carswell. Yes, said his keeper. The end. <laughs> that was like a, a long joke, really. More of a joke, wasn't it? Um, uh, but yeah, very interesting. So thanks, Sammy, for your encouragement. And uh, yeah, a little random bonus story there. So I hope you enjoyed that. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's a short story, but more of a joke, you know. Oh, a fisherman goes to heaven and uh, he has to perpetually catch the same trout in the same stream. Very good, very good. So, um, yeah, just a very short one. Uh, but, yeah, I very much enjoyed it. So, guys, thanks everyone who joined me this evening. I think I'll be back tomorrow with another great British short story. And then on Thursday I'm going to make a change, I think, and read one from the Aldous Huxley collection. Uh, and then, like I said, on Sunday, I can show you again here. On Sunday, I'll be reading about uh, the origins, meaning and tradition of Halloween. So lots coming up. So, yeah, be sure to subscribe if you're not and share the channel around to get some more eyes and ears involved and people to come in and join us for these um, lives and grow the community and followers. But for now, enjoy the rest of your evening and your week and I hope to see you again. But for now, take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye, guys.